välkommen till Börslunch på efn.se. Ja, vi är återigen här på Nasdaq i New York och vi har två bra gäster med oss. Och de, börserna har ju varit upp nästan hela veckan. Idag är det lite grann ner. Och det här är ju i händelserna efter valet. Och, eh, all time high slogs ju på Dow Jones igår till exempel. Ja, med oss idag för att diskutera framtiden har vi Christopher Bourdain, mäklare på Handelsbanken här i New York, men också uh, Michael Matarazzo at Franklin Templeton. Welcome to the both of you. Thank you. Thank Chris, you. you've been uh, with us before, but Michael, could you start off by telling a little, us a little bit about what you do at Franklin Templeton? Sure. Well, I wear several hats, uh, one of which is the co-chair of our fixed income policy committee, which sets strategy and uh, directional views uh, for the fixed income currency markets. Uh, I also head up our insurance portfolio management group, working with insurance companies, managing, helping them manage their uh, parts of their portfolios as well as providing them with insurance solutions. And also I'm a, I'm a portfolio manager focused mainly on the United States but also involved a little bit outside the U.S. So mostly the bond side as opposed to Chris, your yes. stock market broker. Chris, are you surprised about what has happened this week? Yes, uh, on several fronts, and I think uh, since you had me on uh, the other night on uh, on an evening comment, I mean, I, I was right for all of about uh, 20 minutes, I think, when I, when I said I thought a Trump victory initial reaction would be a stock market decline because of his protectionist stances in many ways, which most people see as, as negative for macro and business environment. Uh, well, that looked right for about 20 minutes, but I ended up totally wrong within hours because the market ended up. Uh, I do still think it's probably too early to tell. There are a lot of things we really need to see in who will his team be, what will be their first priorities, second priorities, third priorities. I mean, in the background, you still have him talking about uh, redoing some of the trade treaties that we've already signed, like NAFTA, and scrapping trade treaties we've been talking about signing, like the Pacific Treaty and so on, and possibly imposing in, in a harsher thinking, you know, big tariffs on China. We really need to see Are they going to move forward with that? Will that be an early priority or something further down the road? So, I mean, how, how is the feeling among investors on Wall Street right now? Is it happy days once again? Well, if you look at the last couple of days, uh, I would say certainly people are feeling much more confident that uh, he, in his initial speech, seemed to be taking a very reasonable uh, stance in terms of transition, uh, which I think people saw as a positive. And then also, I think. The real theme, I think, the stock markets are reacting to the last couple of days are the commitments that, uh, that he and his team have made to very, very substantial infrastructure spending in the U.S. And that, of course, is going to pull up cement and steel and all of copper and all of these things if we're going to be building roads and expanding and improving airports and those kinds of things. But Mike, in the, in the bond market, how have people positioned ahead and after? Well, I think that regardless of the outcome of the political outcome i think that there was uncertainty because typically after when you when a president is elected and there's that period before inauguration when it's president elect the president uh tip, they typically come forth with uh with programs with and typically fiscal programs and i think this is what's been what went on in october even before the the elections is that fiscal spending seems to be coming more to the forefront than it has in the past And uh, central banks, rather than just buying and buying and buying government bonds, now they're saying, let's target interest rates. Bank of Japan says a zero interest rate for the 10-year. Uh, the ECB is talking about tapering their buying program or possibly even targeting an interest rate rather than just putting money into the market, which means that there's less investors looking to invest outside of their local markets. And on Wednesday, we saw the 10-year Treasury, uh, U.S. Treasury yield up uh, making the biggest jump in three years That's and right. it's now sitting at over two uh, percent. What factors are in play here? It's pretty high compared to other developed countries. It is. Uh, there's a couple of things to keep in mind uh, that first of all a year ago uh, the 10-year uh, treasury was 235. It ended the year at 225. So we're significant even, even now lower than where we were as we began the year. I think there are a couple of points and just to add to Chris's comments and that is I think that it's not only Um, the way Trump has sort of, in, uh, from his his, his uh, first speech uh, during the middle of the night uh, and afterwards, that he's been relatively uh, um, reading the teleprompter rather than going <laughs> off yeah, yeah. and staying on message. I think as well that there was a sweep, a, a Republican sweep. If there wasn't a Republican sweep, there would be gridlock in Congress, and therefore he would have to focus much more on executive on executive orders, which is pretty dangerous and very controversial. Which means then now that gridlock, which we've been talking about forever, now is being put aside, 
and there, there can be meaningful fiscal spending packages, not just in ones that last a year, but for several years. That's good for the economy. Therefore, <coughs> it also gives the Fed some leeway in terms of raising rates because now the fiscal side of government is doing their part. And up until now, they haven't. It's just purely been the Federal Reserve Bank. And what uh, implications does the outcome of the election have on the U.S. corporate bonds? If a couple of, a, a couple of replies to that. Number one, part of it is how does the equity markets do? Because corporate bonds, especially high yields, do trade somewhat in cor uh, correlated uh, to the equity markets. Um, but I think that typically when interest rates are rising because the, there were prospects for the economy doing better, that typically means corporate bonds do better than treasuries. That's, that's not to say that their yields won't rise, but they typically, the rise in rates is less so than they are in treasuries. And we've seen that this month. That while there are negative returns on long treasuries and long corporates, long corporates are outperforming treasuries by about 2%. High yield is only down 1% this month. I think one of the interesting things, if I could just add to your comment, I mean, I agree the, the notion that we will not have gridlock in Congress, I think, is a very positive thing in general. Uh, but I think one of the peculiarities of some of the policies that Trump has sort of made his benchmark are these are things that I think Democrats could also sign on to, very honestly, right. because infrastructure spending, what, the numbers he's talking about in some ways are higher than what the Democrats were talking about going into the election. He also, uh, a few months back, it kind of disappeared out of media attention, but when he was talking about uh, proposals for helping uh, students fund higher education, came out with uh, some policy proposals that actually were, I think, much, much more liberal than what the Democrats had been talking about in terms of the impact on the federal budget. So uh, it's an unusual aspect that you're going to have a Republican majority in both houses of Congress now asked to approve a Trump budget proposal, which in some ways is more democratic than a democratic proposal. That's kind of an odd situation, but they are under pressure as well, all Republicans in Congress, to show like, hey, we want to prove to everybody we can actually govern. Now we have both houses of Congress. We need to show some unity here. We can't be disputing this right now. So. But, but this infrastructure spend, and you're saying this could go on for a couple of years, how high can we trade these stocks? I mean, what's the limit here? Uh, well, most equity people will tell you there's no limit ever, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> but but we're, I mean, we've already been in kind of a gray zone the last year or two because interest rates have been at historic lows in every developed market, near zero or less than zero. And so people really are kind of throwing a dart at the dartboard when they're trying to figure out what is the appropriate acceptable price earnings multiple in the stock market when interest rates are zero or less than zero. Uh, it used to be back when things were more normal, you know, okay. And then after a while, people were saying <laughs> that the, the bubble is not in the stock market, it's even in the bond market. What is your response to that? I think that there, there are, to, the response would be that there are a lot of investors that are in the bond market, uh, be it the U.S. or global markets, that typically don't have an allocation as high as they do to fixed income. Uh, so even, you don't have to have a massive outflow uh, uh, you know, everybody running out through the, through the uh, same door out of bonds to see yields rise. Even an incremental amount could, could have caused yields rising. However, that doesn't mean that we are going to normalization of rates where you see a four, four and a half percent ten-year bond anytime soon because that will slow the economy down. If rates, if rates in the United States go up while rates elsewhere are still very low, the dollar will strengthen. That will slow the economy down. It will also keep inflation low. So there are checks to prevent that to happen. The other factor that you should take into consideration in the United States is that many investors, insurance companies, retirees especially, that are clamoring for yield and would be buyers of bonds at higher levels because they do want to lock in higher yields than they're getting right now. Right now, they can't live off the income off their bond portfolios. They need higher yields. So I don't think that it's necessarily because rates are rising. First of all, I think you're, we're putting too much emphasis on <coughs> fiscal policy for fiscal policy to move the needle significantly and for a long period of time. I think it's an incremental gain. I think, it'll, I think it frees the Fed up to be a little bit more aggressive if it makes sense. But I don't think that it's a, it's a total game changer. And the other last thing I would say is let's not extrapolate 
two days of market performance, <laughs> yeah, both in the equity markets yeah, as well as the bond markets out into the future for, for any, any extended you period of time. infrastructure <laughs> stand would go on for It can, long. it can, but, but the point... First, it, we need it, to it, approve it, actually. Yeah, we need yeah. to, but it, 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 the, the numbers have to be quite large, but hopefully infrastructure spending, almost by definition, takes a long period of time. I hope you don't I, mind. I want to ask you, Chris, uh, okay. just, uh, do you see any sectors where stocks maybe could gain by this stronger domestic uh, industry, but it hasn't yet been discounted in the... Uh, well, I mean, I think in general, the equity markets, if anything, discount too much too fast uh, in general. So, I mean, we saw big moves in machinery makers like Caterpillar this week. Uh, anybody who's digging copper out of the ground, uh, those kinds of things, or helping others to dig copper out of the ground mining equipment makers. So, I think... The reaction in the equity markets tends to be pretty quick and sometimes, uh, as you've hinted, sometimes maybe a little overdone for one day's worth of inf new information and the new information is basically just a hint of something that might happen. We actually don't know if it'll happen. I hope you don't mind if I ask Mike yeah, the question because sure, yeah, sure. I, I, I think it, it, I've had a personal kind of theory for a while and since you're managing a fixed income portfolio, I wonder what, uh, what you think about it. My view is if we raised if the Fed raised interest rates half a percent or one percent tomorrow, I mean, a big move, and then we got to much higher rate, I think a typical insurance company or pension fund high-grade bond portfolio will still actually see an overall decline in their interest rate return for like another two, three years because you still have 5% coupon bonds aging out and 4% coupon bonds aging out, and, and, and there's going to be a natural trend for the next two, three years, regardless of what central banks do tomorrow or in three months. And would you agree with that as a kind of thesis that what people actually are earning in their portfolios will continue I, to go that's down? That's right, because most most companies, most insurance companies, they, obviously they have a portfolio that's already in place. So it's more in terms of flow, be it mature uh, securities running off or new money being put into the market. And that's a gradual type of move. So you have you have the uh, high coupons coming off, which, which will lower yields on reinvestment, but then new money that, that's coming into their business that's being invested that would, would, would boost it. But it's going to be gradual. And that's one reason I think, I mean, we've met before, and I've generally taken a fairly positive view on the equity markets for that reason, because even if we see a reversal of uh, central bank rates in the U.S. or Europe, up to what would appear to be a fairly significant extent, you know, a percent, a full percent, which I don't think anyone sees happening. Uh, you're still going to have overall returns that real people and real companies are earning on those portfolios still coming down for another two, three years. So where does the money go? I think there's going to be a structural need to continue to increase risk allocation equities. You saw the Norwegian Sovereign Fund recommending this very recently. That's the biggest sort of fund in the world. And I think many, many others are going to have to come to the similar decision. So. We discussed a lot about uh, infrastructure investments, but what, what other effects do you see of Trump coming in? He's trying to repatriate money, probably, going forward, and uh, being a bit more protectionistic. We have some graphs over unemployment rates and wages. How do you see that playing out in the economy? Um, okay. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the... I think the infrastructure spending will be helpful in terms of employment. Uh, right now, we probably are at a full employment economy in the United States. But having said that, there still are a lot of people out of, out of work and uh, people that, that don't have the skills for jobs. And I think that over a period of time, we will see those jobs being filled. And I think, I think there's, if we have a, once again, a, uh, a president that um, is, is focused uh, and keeps the, uh, the rhetoric low, um, I think that the business cycle can, can have an additional uh, length in time. Uh, and, and I think that's important because we are, we've, we're in the 86th or 87th month of the business cycle. So it's been going on for a long period of time. The one in the 1990s lasted 120 months or 10 years. So, and that's, that's quite a possibility. Uh, and I think that with the spending, with, uh, uh, with cer certain programs that could be put into place, by keeping health care costs down, by some tweaks to the Affordable Care Act, I think those are all f factors that increase business confidence as well as consumer confidence. And therefore, for the consumer, 
means that they won't keep the savings rate as high if they have more confidence and probably if, especially if there's banking reform in terms of reversing some of Dodd-Frank, banks will be more willing to lend to consumers and therefore they can take on a little bit more leverage. This helps growth and extends the business cycle. What do you I think, think uh, what effects will it have on inflation that Janet Yellen is looking for so long? Well, I, I think one of the more interesting bits and pieces of, of things that, uh, and again, I'm just going on what Trump has said in public during the campaign. So, I mean, things always can change. But in terms of uh, what he's promised out in the hinterlands, which I think helped very much to get him elected, you heard these statements like, you know, we're going to bring high-paying jobs back to pick your depressed area, you know, East Lansing, Michigan, or Wheeling, uh, West Virginia, where you used to have auto plants, where you used to have steel plants and things like that. And I mean, I, I, I think any candidate, either party, who goes to places like that and promises things like that, I just think is, is first, it, it, it's false. It's a false promise. It's selling magic potion. It, it, it can't really work. But if the initial attempts he makes to try and, you know, bring good paying jobs back to these areas somehow take place, one of those could be very high tariffs against Chinese and Mexican imports, for example. If you look at the auto industry as a perfect example, okay, they have been moving production to lower cost countries for decades, and then all of their suppliers have been following them and saying, okay, well, I used to sell you your stuff in Michigan here, but now I'm going to put my plant in Mexico to sell it over there. So if you raise tariffs, it's going to take 10 years for Ford Motor Company to then redo its supply chain yet again and move its ecosphere of suppliers back into the United States. But if they do, and this is where I think there's a bit of magic potion selling going on here, uh, if they do, it's not going to be in places like Michigan. It's going to be in places where you've seen the foreign auto industry invest investing for years. It'll be in places like Alabama. It'll be in places like Georgia, where there's traditionally low union uh, power and where logistically they're in a good place to basically deliver stuff within 24 hours to like three quarters of the US population. It's not going to be in places like Michigan. And also it will not employ as many people because it takes now basically one fifth of the man hours to build a car in a major auto plant than it did 10, 15 years ago. So when you shut a plant in Michigan 20 years ago, even if you built a plant with that capacity now in Georgia, it would only employ like you know a tenth as many workers or 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 twenty percent of the workers that's the same in the steel industry it's the same yeah. in the textile yeah. industry it's the same in every industry you just don't need that many people everything has been automated out so uh, and it, so I think that part won't happen the way he says it will or or his people have said it will but the main thing is if you do think about what he's said tariffs maybe bringing high paying jobs to some of these areas, it means very, very, very big wage inflation. I mean, if you bring good jobs to Michigan, people will leave their jobs at Walmart and go get the good job. Mm -hmm. If and they can. Then, if they can. And then suddenly you have wage pressure in these areas where there aren't a lot of job opportunities, so now you need to pay that guy 20% more to stay over here. So that's actually, there's a lot of wage inflation baked into what he's how been saying. Does, how does all of this play together with uh, the Fed's uh, plans to raise interest rates? I think that it, I, I think that as we see see the see the landscape right now, and it's really, it's we're really looking far off. Once again, it's two two days, three days after the election. But I think that with fiscal policy, um, it will allow the Fed, if, which would which should provide some incremental growth to the economy, probably at the margin, help inflation edge up, especially in terms of wages. I think it gives the Fed. Um, flexibility in terms of raising rates uh, because the economy is doing well without monetary policy. So it gives them more flexibility to raise rates. Does that mean that, that they're going to raise rates, you know, three times next year? Probably not. Uh, you know, the, most, the, the market thinks they're going to raise rates once in 2017. Uh, they say twice, and probably that, that's it. Uh, because it does take time for these these programs to to actually uh, uh, be implemented. But you both seem quite positive on on the U.S. economy. But according to Bofa that came last month, cash is at all time high at fund managers. So there is a lot of cash on the sidelines. People don't dare to invest. Or how do you look upon it? Is it just a huge opportunity? Or I mean, as, as I've said, I, and I've thought this for a while. I mean, we didn't know how the election was coming out, so I do think a lot of people were kind of reducing their risk stance because there were very, very divergent policy statements being made by the two candidates. 
Uh, I do think now that people will have a month or two to kind of hear how is this going to shape out. Is it going to be moderate? Is it going to be extreme? Is it going to be a lot of stuff in one year or slow things over five? Uh, I think a lot of the cash will end up being put to use. And I'm, as you've heard, generally take the view that there is not much by way of alternative to equity markets, right or wrong. And maybe multiples go to historic highs that some people might point to and say, oh, my God, I mean, that's, that's too much. And yet there are really rather few alternatives. I mean, people need to deploy the cash in a way that actually has the potential to give them real income or that has the potential to pay out big insurance claims with an insurance company or a pension liability at a pension fund. I mean, they, they need to put this money to work. Right, because so. we saw in the same uh, survey that uh, they were underweight stocks generally. Michael, from your perspective, how should you allocate between stocks and bonds right now? Yeah, as far as a, an allocation between the two, I think that really depends upon either the individual or, or, a, um, or a pension fund or an insurance company's risk profile. Uh, it, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we would we would probably, you know, be a little bit more predisposed to adding to, adding to equities uh, at this point because it does seem that the fiscal policy measures will be good for the economy. And so if we see a pickup in economic growth and productivity, that's good for corporations. If there's repatriation of uh, foreign earnings, that's good for corporations and that, and that, should, that should be good for equities. And it's fantastic because when a bond guy says you should be in equities, <laughs> then we're near all time. But I would we just go back to what I said earlier, though. I mean, some of this depends on the order of the priorities. I mean, if the first thing these guys agree on in the Senate uh, next year and, and Congress is let's slap a 35 percent tariff on Chinese imports, yeah. you are really going to destroy the auto industry in this country in a very, very short period of time because they're sourcing all of their auto parts from, from China and small components. The, computer industry, I mean, everybody would be very negatively affected if that's the first priority. If it's a later thing in stages, okay. It's a later thing. It's a later thing. <laughs> it was very nice having you both here. Thanks Thank you very us. much. Thank you. For a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.